everybody, welcome to Inside Quest. We're the spark for your brain training. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can help you mold a more powerful mind through mental exercise. And if you're looking to pour miracle grow on your intellectual capabilities, there's no better guest than the man joining us today. His groundbreaking work in neuropsychiatry has established him as a globally recognized expert in the science of brain fitness connection, a body of research that has revealed such transformative insights into well-being that he's embarked on a worldwide mission to re-engineer schools, corporations, and individual lifestyle practices through exercise. His revolutionary views on the evolution of the human mind and the wild methods by which it is brought into peak performance have made him a living legend in the world of brain hacking and personal development, as well as making him a mainstay of mainstream media. His hyper-effective brain optimization strategies have been featured on ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, NPR, Newsweek, The Washington Post, US News and World Report, and The New York Times, just to name a few. A highly sought after speaker, he has also lectured extensively throughout the US, Canada, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, and Europe. He serves as an advisor to several governmental agencies around the world, and he's been named Reebok's ambassador for active kids, advisor to the California Governor's Council on Physical Fitness Activity and Sport, and adjunct professor at Taiwan National Sports University. And as if that wasn't enough, he's also an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. Please help me in welcoming the man who has been recognized by his peers as one of the best doctors in America since 1997, the best-selling author of over 60 peer-reviewed articles and eight books published in 14 languages, including the groundbreaking ADD, ADHD series, Driven to Distraction, Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain, and most recently, Go Wild, Free Your Body and Mind from the Afflictions of Civilization, Dr. John Rady. John, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we booby trapped that. So. <laughs> That's great. That's a good thing you did your Hindu squats yep. and you're uh, you're ready for the surprises. Yeah, I know. I did my balance training yesterday, so I'm I'm all set. Nicely done. Um, one of the things that, as a student of the brain, I found utterly intoxicating about your work is how usable it is. Hyper practical. It's things like before we came on, you were actually doing the Hindu squats that you make people do when you speak, which I think is awesome. Um, it, it's all really usable, it has deep implication. What would you say is the most profound thing you've come across that these guys could put into action in their lives right now that would help them achieve a higher level of success and well-being? Well, it's just to know that when you're exercising, it might seem like you're just trying to be buff and get your physical body moving and uh, get it in shape and feel better about yourself physically. But what you're really doing is you're working more nerve cells in your brain when you're exercising than in any other human activity. You're, you're making the, your brain work. And what we've learned in the past 25 years or so is that the brain is, is a muscle. You have to think of the brain as a muscle. The more you stress it, the more you use it, the better it gets. The stronger each nerve cell gets, which mm. is really, I think, the most revolutionary way to think about uh, exercise and what all we're doing with exercising, not just building our muscles, but really taxing our brain. This is, I think, really, really important stuff. So the, the point of the show here, and, and to me, the point of life is to like, see how much you can improve your state. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you end up, how hard you're willing to work and develop. Um, and to me, working to develop the mind is, is the most potent thing that you could work to develop. But it really, until your book, Spark, which I read a, a few years ago, um, it didn't dawn on me how tightly connected the mind and the body were, and I had gone on a physical journey for other reasons, um, not really making the association though until I read your book. In watching the videos that you've done and some of the talks that you've given, you introduced me to a quote which was like that keystone piece that made everything fit together, which is the Lalinus quote, is that how you pronounce his name? Yep. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically the reason you have a brain is to move. Right, it's the, uh, that our thinking brain is the evolutionary internalization of our moving brain. Because our brain evolved over 400 million years and we became the evolutionary victors. And what happened with our brain is we developed parts of our brain to be the best movers, to plan, to predict, to sequence, to remember. Abstract thinking came along and then we had words and then we became 
uh, much more verbal, and we use the same nerve cells that we evolved to help us be the best movers, to be a thinker, to be cognate. Yeah, and the way that it plays out in our lives is pretty incredible. And, and over the certainly over Spark uh, and Go Wild, you draw some amazing parallels in terms of how you can leverage it in your own life. But the, one of the stories that um, you introduced me to as I was going through just the, the research around the topic is the story of the sea squirt. Um, tell these guys about that, because that, that was so impactful in terms of making it clear the, the connection between needing a brain when you need to move and not needing a brain if you don't need to move. Right, that's a very good uh, illustration. The sea squirt is, is a little piece of uh, coral that breaks off of an obsidian coral and it develops into a sea squirt, which is like a little uh, seahorse, really tiny. And it lasts for about 12 hours. And in that sea squirt, you have a brain and a notochord, it's called, a spinal cord, for the animal to swim to a place to uh, sit down and launch on another piece of coral or another rock. And then the brain is reabsorbed. So, so all the brain tissue, is, save for a few cells, are gone. So the idea is, we need our brains to move. And if we don't move, we're going to use that material in other ways. And that's what <clears throat> happens in part as we age. And we stop using it as much as we used to. Uh, and we see erosion, we see changes that, that lead to cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, which is really very important today. The number one way to avoid uh, cognitive decline is b both having a healthy body, uh, but exercise itself. Yeah, and I want to say it for these guys a little more aggressively because you're young and you think you can get away with anything. It's a beautiful time in your life. Uh, but this really is like a, a use it or lose it example out in the wild, right? So you have this thing that for 12 hours has a brain, but once it settles down and puts down roots, it literally eats its own brain and redistributes it. That, that's what happens when you don't use something, right? Muscle atrophies, the brain will atrophy. If you're not actively doing something to push it forward, and the thing that I take away from your work is that there is, there is a, a, it would be dangerous to misunderstand the connection between your physicality and your brain. Um, and one of the things that he does when he gives talks is he starts by making everybody get up and, and they do these exercises. Um, more as an illustrative example, but tell them about the, um, the school that sort of started this all for you. Yeah, the, the, I was always interested in exercise because of our work in attention deficit disorder because that's a very good way of treating ADD or, or using uh, exercise as a code treatment. But, and so I was always wanting to write about exercise because we saw its effect in depression, we saw it in anxiety, we saw it in aggression substance abuse, but I hadn't had a, uh, an example of how exercise can make you smarter as a young child. Uh, there were a bunch of studies out there, but they were weak. And then I heard about this school in Naperville, School District 203, that evolved its PE program over 20 years. It was amazing. Why well, I heard about them is they were on front line, and that year they had evaluated their kids 3% of them were overweight. Not one child in the high school was obese out of 7,500 kids. 3% in the average in the U.S. at that point was 33%. Whoa! 99% of the kids took the TIMS test, the International Science and Math Test, mm. which every country takes every three years. The U.S. is always in the low teens somewhere, or high teens now. Uh, they took it as a country. So they separated themselves off from the rest of the U.S. and we want to be looked at as a country so a you can country. see what we're doing. See how good we are. Right. Well, they came in number one in the world in science and number six in math. So that said, okay, here are these, here's this school, which was going against a trend that had P.E. every day, but it was fitness-based P.E. It was boot camps. Right. It was running. It was always amazing. See these felt-looking kids walking around motivated. They're an A++ school, meaning they're the top of the heap in Illinois, 
and they spend the middle amount per student per year for education. So there's some schools spending twice as much right. that they're wow. competing with. And they're still just still, crushing they're, they're them. They're crunch, crunching everything. Now, you've looked at inner city schools that are replicating the model as well. Right. And what are we seeing there? Poor schools especially, that's what I call low-hanging fruit. We get a powerful effect. Uh, the first thing that happens when you introduce something the, where the kids are moving every day is you see a drop in disciplinary problems. And if you talk to teachers from these schools, they've spent most of their lives being policemen in the classroom, dealing with altercations, dealing with bad behavior. We showed one school in Charleston, South Carolina, that introduced a, a morning PE program for really difficult kids from very poor backgrounds. Uh, they started every morning with 30 minutes of games, very intense games, but they were moving. There, the first semester, there was an 83% drop in disciplinary referrals. Wow. So, you know, then you say, whoa, something's happening here. And they also, the teachers loved it. They couldn't believe how the kids were attentive. Kids started coming to school more often, mm. which is a big problem in, in the U.S. is attendance. And they were interested. So one of the main topics in neuroscience these days is how does exercise affect the brain mm. and how can we make it better because it is without a doubt one of the sure ways of pushing back cognitive decline and lowering the incidence of Alzheimer's disease absolutely yeah it's so it's uh, this is so powerful to me because of the you know going back to what I was saying at the beginning it's so usable um, you know one of the things that I found just in so I'm obsessed right now in my life with the concept of taking things down to their physics. Physics is a stand-in just for like the most basic, the, the, the real fundamental building block of how it works, right? And when I think about optimizing my own brain, you get some early gains, right? You read, uh, you just be inquisitive, and those things, when you feed that inquisitive nature in yourself, you just start encountering cool stuff, and it's like, whoa, this new idea, and they sort of flow to the next. But then you hit a certain level where it's like, okay, how do I now keep eking more and more performance out? And when you, adopt the training mentality, uh, it can get a little esoteric. And I think people can lose sense of what, what's the physics of this, right? What should I actually be doing to push myself forward? And so your book really says the, the foundational um, building block of the brain is uh, this evolutionary move towards movement. Um, we have an innate, and this is another concept from evolutionary psychology, we have this innate desire to tackle the challenges in our environment, right? And there's reasons why that might be. The society around us starts outpacing our ability to keep up from an evolutionary standpoint. You get this total disconnect. And that was really the, the step into your new book, Go Wild, which I found um, really interesting. And if I'm honest, going into it, I thought, okay, here we go. This is like going to be another book just all about diet. And, and even though I believe in a lot of those tenets, I think that it's sort of overplayed um, and, and oversimplified a little bit, but you stayed away from that. So how did you go beyond diet in, into really understanding it? And uh, what, what does going wild mean? What we talked about there and what, well, the reason why I was driven to that is because after exercise and diet, there's all this research that has come out and we know about how important sleep is and being in nature is and being mindful is and small tribes, being connected to a small tribe and, and uh, certainly the family, but even an extended family. And, and the, the, the issue was, uh, it sparked for me back to look at evolution, to look at how we evolved as, as creatures, our genes and our brains, certainly but also uh, how, what other programs were in there and what was it like for uh, you know, 10,000 10, years ago before we had farming. Right. We were doing all these things. We were sleeping differently, much longer, without the electric light. And certainly our diets were different, very varied, which is really what's important there. In fact, and, do you, and, go into that one for me for sure. a second. It was evolving, the real, we were realizing the evils of sugar, mm. the evils of, of too much glucose and, uh, in, in our system and seeing the obesity and the di diabetes type 2 epidemic around the world. It's not just in the U.S., it's around the world. Right. Uh, and it's because we've gone for, we've become fat phobic in, during the 80s when everybody was staying away from fats and all that. And what we substituted was high-carb diets. Right. 
and now the, the food pyramid is gradually being turned upside down. So now eggs are in and uh, saturated, good saturated fats are in uh, and, and carbs are verboten, forget, forbidden. Right. And uh, even the big argument, well, what about whole grains? Whole grains, well, they're just, they're, because grains are power packed glucose. It's like, it's not a sugar drink uh, like most people think of as, as raising your glucose, but pasta and anything, anything white except cauliflower will raise your glucose level. Right. Uh, but, but the whole grain business is it, it just delays raising your glucose level. Now, the reason why that's important is because when we, are, we have our hunter-gatherer genes, mm. okay? We have that program that was evolved back then. Well, we didn't have grains. You know, there were wild grains, wild rice and all that, but we had over 350 vegetables that we were after and fruits and nuts and tubers and things that are, you know, the favorites of the paleo crowd, the right. paleo diet, uh, and certainly meat, but different meat than what we have because we have all grass-fed meat is very different than corn-fed meat. And we, what really probably led to our victory over the Neanderthals was learning how to fish. So that we, back then we were eating right. We were eating correctly. Uh, and and now we know that glucose is, is a toxin. Think about this. Glucose is in our system and we have insulin to take it out. That's what its job is, to take it out of the system, get it into the cell. And when we overdo it with too much glucose, what happens? We overwhelm the insulin. It gets to, eventually gets tired and you can develop diabetes type two or metabolic syndrome. But if you have it high at any point and you can't get it into your muscles or storage, some places glycogen, it's turned into fat. So you see these, these incredible parallels. As we became more fat phobic, our obesity crisis began and right. continues to rise to this day. Yeah, one of the things that was so powerful in the book, and guys, one thing I really hope you do and fear you don't, is that when these amazing people come on, they're giving you the absolute tip of the iceberg, but their books, man, that's where they really go into the detail. One of the things that was so cool in his book, Go Wild, is how he details how, as like, you wanna talk about getting down to the physics? This man gets down to the physics. And he talks about how, if we're gonna become this bipedal upright thing, we've gotta abandon this long digestive tract, right? So now that means that we can't process grass, which is like the most ubiquitous thing on the planet, everybody else is eating it. But we can, and this is your quote, and I loved it, we can outsource the eating of the grass by letting other animals do it, right? And the reason I wanted him to talk about this now is this concept of variety. So, and this is, you know, for anybody that's paying attention to my personal life, you know that my wife and I, we reduced the scope of our diet so much that my poor wife, because she was on antibiotics, ended up destroying her microbiome. And she has been suffering painfully from just a lack of diversity, a lack of diversity in the microorganisms in her gut, and then the reverberation of having for so long a lack of diversity in her diet. And he talks about how these animals, that first of all, they roam, right? So they're roaming over these huge amounts of land and they're eating grass in different areas and thusly getting different micronutrients. We let them do that into maturity. So it's years and years and years of migratory patterns eating all these different various uh, micronutrients and then, with empathy, we hunt them down and you'll get what that means when you read the book. But with empathy, we go out, we hunt these animals and are able to thus take in all of those micronutrients that they've been storing in their fat so kindly for us uh, and the other tissues. And it was just like, oh my God, like really understanding the sort of trade-offs as we evolve into the creatures that we are now and how that's incredibly useful information for all of us moving forward. Because we live in this hyper abstract world. Nothing is wild, right? And what are some of the other pain points of not living in a wild environment? Well, I think a big one today is, is nature. We're beginning to realize that nature means something. We should be in nature. For instance, in a cardiac care unit, they, they, they evaluated this with post-op post patients who were just having uh, cardiac surgery and, and one group had nothing on the walls another group just had a picture of outside on the right. walls and those people got better faster used less medicine got out of the hospital and had a better result just from having a view 
So I want to go back to one of the things you said about wellness, because there is there is a stat in your book that is so unbelievable. I know that you guys did the study twice because it just seemed impossible. Um, and I, I am the, what I'm about to say, I am definitely the most guilty human being on the face of the planet of. Uh, but I often equate optimizing brain function with higher degrees of success, right? Like achieving more in my life and well-being be damned. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's this sort of metrics driven, I've set this goal, I'm going to achieve this goal. So knowing full well that I fall into that trap, you guys talk about meditation a lot, which was not a topic I expected to find in your book. Um, <laughs> but you talk about how meditators heal four times faster, four times faster than people who don't. That seems impossible. How is that true? Right, right. Well, meditation itself is just practicing mindfulness. You know, it's, it's sort of giving define a... Define that, because you define it differently mind, than most people. Mindfulness is just being present, being present in the environment. Being present the way a hunter-gatherer yeah, is Yes, present. yes, being present and searching and being aware and appreciating everything. And so what, what you find, med, people think, oh, meditation, meditation, but it, that, it's, that it's a passive brain process. It's very active. It's very active to get into the meditative state and, uh, or to do yoga or to do Tai Chi. It's very active. Your brain, I'm talking about sure. now, because uh, you're, you're sitting still, but your brain is really turned on. So you're, you're challenging your brain very similar to if you were running a four mile uh, or six mile race. You know, you're uh, you're, you're using your brain cells, and, and our brain loves to be used. And we have the phrase that you alluded to with the sea squirts, use it or lose it. You know, if you don't use it, then our, our body evolved to be really, you know, parsimonious, saying, okay, we're not using this, this uh, fat and stuff that our brain cells are made of, let's use it someplace else. Mm. So you begin to metabolize it, and that leads to decline. So if exercise is so good for us, and feel so good, and meditating is so good for us, and feels so good, why does it suck so much? Because <laughs> nobody does it, right? <coughs> like, I'm hyper aware of the benefits of this stuff, and I have to drag myself into the gym. I have to drag myself to meditate. That's, what I, that's why you do it with a small tribe. That's the success, for instance, of CrossFit, but think about the spinning groups that preceded them or the swimming teams. That's how groupiness. you combat it. That, that, that's a groupiness. Now, I'll tell you why we, we need we that. Go. Why we need yes. that is that we also evolved what's, what's called these uh, uh, genes that help us eat the highest caloric food that we can find. Thrifty genes, right? Yes, and save it. Right. And to be thrifty with our material. Okay, that was back 10,000 years ago. So you were starting down the path of how we combat it. So we can use small groups, tribes. Um, what are some other ways to, to combat the, the natural inclinations of the thrifty genes? Well, also to get the right diet. I mean, you know, is, is to be aware of what you're, what you're eating. Many of us in medicine have been talking about for 10, 20 years now is to avoid carbohydrates like the plague. And that's hard because chips, cookies, right. uh, all the things that are appealing to us are full of glucose. And, and that leads to a very bad outcome. And, and we know that. And so for instance, diabetes type two is a big deal in, as we age, big deal. In fact, a number of research centers looking at Alzheimer's disease Call Alzheimer's diabetes type three, yeah, because that is such a driver yeah. of cell death, and glucose is a big part of it. Yeah, that's um, that is uh, woo, a, a a bordering on religious debate, and I know you know that um, while maybe people would agree on sugar, not everybody would agree on carbohydrates. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting. And being in this industry, being in the nutrition industry, it is utterly fascinating. One, how much we still don't know, 
about uh, human metabolism and only now is the microbiome really being taken seriously and I think that the microbiome uh, is going to become one of the most important things that we deal with from a, a dietary and nutrition standpoint and if you guys know Human Longevity Inc, um, a company that was founded by Bob Hariri, Craig Venter and Peter Diamandis, one of the things that they want to do is sequence the genome of your gut microbiome, not just the human genome, but the actual microbiome. And the microbiome is, there's more cells in your microbiome than there is in your own body. I mean, it's like literally crazy. And we're only just now beginning to understand this stuff and what different strains do and what strains we need. But the study that you talked about, which I thought was really fascinating, is you can take mice that are obese, take their microbiome and put it into a mouse that's in shape, don't change their diet, and the in-shape mouse will get obese. Why do you think that is? Well, because, uh, because these, my, the microbiome is powerful. That's, that's a big new word in, in, in medicine, certainly. It's in the past 10, 10 years or so, the microbiome. It's something that we never learned about in medical school. Sure. You know, didn't you say, oh, well, yeah, we have bacteria and worms in our gut, but so what? But now we know. <laughs> It seems we know we have interest, but yeah, 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 you know. But now we're drilling down. People are drilling mm -hmm. down to see what we need to do to affect our microbiome and how microbiomes are different in one part part of the world and another, and and how they might get similar living with the, the person you're living with. Uh, all that really is just beginning to be unpacked. Mm -hmm. And the more we understand that, the uh, the healthier and the more higher state of well-being we'll be able to achieve and and uh, you know just by and i've seen it just by changing the diet changing the microbiome and even now there's vanderbilt they they've been doing it for years they bring you in if you have something like your wife might have they wipe out your microbiome with a lot of antibiotics and then they put you in you put in the virgin poop you know a fecal poop transplants, implant, fecal baby. transplant yeah it's amazing uh, when I was researching this 15 years ago and read about it, it was done in Australia and Vanderbilt, and I said, oh, my God. Yeah. It's the first time I'd heard of it. Yeah. You know, I was like, whoa. And now you know it. Right. There's a fecal transplant center at MIT, you know. The first time you encounter the concept of fecal transplant, it's a day you remember. Yes. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're reading. What? <laughs> it was, yeah, I was literally like, did I read that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Tim Ferriss, who we had on the show, he actually talked, he was going to get a fecal transplant as like an experimentation. And then he was like, you know what, there's so many things about this that we don't understand yeah. yet. He was like, oof, the potential diseases that may not impact that person but could be a problem for me if I take it into my system. So he ended up not doing it. But it, it really, it just the abstracting it from fecal transplants for a second, the, the whole universe of the microbiome is, is really, really fascinating. Um, and in some ways triggers, at least in my head, uh, an interest or um, a, a similar thing as, the, as epigenetics. And you dealt epigenetics oh, yes. sort of a, a glancing blow um, in your work. <laughs> what do you think is the importance of epigenetics? How does it compare to genetics? Oh, it's huge. Epigenetics means turning certain brains on more than others. We have the genes, right? We, we have the hunter-gatherer genes, but we turn on different genes than we used to 10,000 years ago. That's why uh, getting into the right habits, getting into the, the right discipline will have an effect on your genes. You know, with exercise, you, you turn on different genes than if you're not. Mm. Uh, and you turn on, specifically, you turn on a great gene you, because when you use a nerve cell, you release a lot of things, but you release all these neurotransmitters. And I've said that a bout of exercise is like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of Ritalin because you increase the concentration of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. But you also increase the release of a substance called BDNF. Mm brain-derived neurotropic factor. And that is the biggest news in the past 15 years in psychiatry. Because BDNF is what I call miracle growth for the brain. It's brain fertilizer. It keeps your brain cells young, perky, ready to grow. It modulates their being a little extreme. So you put the brakes on depression, anxiety, uh, but it absolutely is the agent that helps you learn because we know now in 2000 a couple of Nobel prizes were given that the way we learn anything 
is if our brain cells grow. You don't if there's no growth. And BDNF is the biggest fertilizer that you can imagine. Now, it has a lot of support team that come up from the body or also in the brain that have a lot to do with repair. For instance, when you lift weights, okay, how can that have my brain? Well, one, you're, you're using a lot of nerve cells. Two, you're, you're breaking muscle fibers. And when you break muscle fibers, you set up a recovery process. Mm. And this recovery process sends out great stuff like IGF-1, FGF-2, VEGF that helps to repair the muscle. It also releases endorphins and endocannabinoids. Now endorphins are our body's own morphine and endocannabinoids is our body's own cannabis. Right. Uh, and it helps block the pain response from the muscle tearing, but it also, they also go up to the brain and help us have a good mood. They contribute, all things contribute to our feeling better after we've exercised. The thing that's hardest is remembering how good you feel right. after you exercise. You will be at a higher state of being if you exercise. So Yeah, it's really, really interesting. And motivation is something that we talk a lot about on the show. And it's, it's one of the, I get asked two questions a lot. Like, how do you motivate yourself when you're not feeling up for it that day? Um, and then, you know, what's your, uh, how do you find your passion? Those are really the two that I think people struggle with the most. And, and that, going through your work, and you touch on it with the thrifty gene, and, and I'm uh, like, I'm tempted to just let you walk off into the sunset with that one, but I still find it really unsettling. And the reason, because it's so much more powerful than my desire to get up and exercise, right? And, and the things that I've had to trick in my own mind to do it, and here's my guess as to why we're in that situation. Just like nature does not uh, incentivize having children, it incentivizes having sex, right? You have sex, obviously the ultimate goal for nature is that you procreate. But where it puts all of its in incentivizing muscle and effort is into making sex pleasurable so that you'll seek it out. Um, I think that's true with food. And so what's happened is the, the impulse that's meant to make you get up and chase that animal for 26 miles and use the endurance hunting techniques that the tribesmen use is, is your compulsion, your hunger, your literal hunger to go and track that beast down. But once I can go to a Ralph's and I can get whatever I want, whenever I want, and I can get ding-dongs and cupcakes, all of a sudden, the drive that would normally get me out of bed doesn't get me out of bed. And the one thing that nature made sure was so cool that I would be sure to get up and do that has been just handed to me. Right, right. And, and uh, along with that, it hands you those devices which are so addicting and so powerful. And, and you're talking about like cell phones? Cell phones and the internet and TV. You know, they uh, really hit our addiction centers, our pleasure centers, our reward centers, mm. all the same. And uh, it's a big, huge problem because that encourages, most of the time, a sedentary lifestyle. The more we sit, which is increasing over time, the, the, the unhealthier we get. Now, back to, to the motivation, though. It, it is so important that, and, and that's why it's important in the small tribe business, so you're a member of a group, you go to CrossFit with your tribe, you, you go spinning with your group, uh, you do boot camp with your group. Uh, any, of the, any and all of those keep you coming because there's the stickiness of the group mm. that helps you uh, overcome your reluctance to do it. And, uh, Talk to us about the neuropeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin, see that's where the groupiness comes in. Uh, the, the, the small tribe, when you're connected to people, you re release more of this oxytocin, which is the love hormone. When you exercise, you release a lot as well. When you make love, you release it. When you have a baby, you're overflowing with oxytocin. And when it helps let down the milk, and, and then every time you breastfeed, more oxytocin is there. So think about this. The mother just delivered the baby. She should hate that baby because <laughs> of the pain that it caused was incredible. Right. But what does she do? Oh, my God, this is so great. You know, and that's oh, oxytocin is going crazy. And she'll remember everything about that because oxytocin makes us our brain cells ready to take in and log in 
what just happened. Right. And vasopressin is a male uh, more involved with the male. That was their major job is to protect. And so vas vasopressin uh, helps the males uh, really hold on to the family. And that's when you, when you hear about domestic violence and where there's, I mean, the big trigger for domestic violence is when the woman finally says, I'm leaving. And then it's really dangerous because those vasopressin comes up and says, you've got to preserve this family. Right. And she's trying to break it up, you know. So uh, anyway, that's a, that's a aside from uh, uh, no, clinical and, work. And so I know that's a little headier than we normally go in the show. The reason that I wanted him to bring that up, I really believe that most people are manipulated by their brain. And the reason they're manipulated by their brain is because they don't understand what's happening. And it is my fundamental base belief that the more you know about what your brain is doing, the more you understand the chemicals that are flowing, the more you can take control of it. And in my own life, one of the earliest wins I started getting was just, I started reading about the brain. I started reading about uh, neuropeptides and neurotransmitters and just really understanding that there was a specific chemical that was happening at a specific moment and you talk about faking a smile and how it actually does have an impact as long as it touches the corner of your eyes though and it can't be too false or it doesn't trigger the vagus nerve and I mean like all of this stuff is it's quantifiable right so you can go in and you can really look at what's happening and once you realize what's happening you'll be shocked at how much you can manipulate it you'll be shocked at how much you can actually go ah like what i need right now with my spouse significant other whatever the case may be is i need to reconnect right i need to do things that are going to pump oxytocin I want that loving bond, I want that feeling, or you're disconnected from your kid, you want that, you know, that reconnection, and you talk about in your book how in tribes a lot of times they'll do simple things like they'll sit next to each other and touch shoulders or cross ankles, and just while they don't have a clinical understanding of why they're doing that, those little things are releasing certain cascades of chemicals. So, and just in terms of you know, obviously my thing with the show is free you from the matrix, give you the things that you need to be in control of your own life. Like that's really powerful and can have massive implications in your life once you understand what's really going on, right? Once you understand, ah, I'm in a piss poor mood, that's because of X, Y, Z. Ah, I feel really connected and I'm gonna fan these flames because I wanna remember this event later or whatever the case may be. That, that stuff is incredibly powerful and I really, really hope that you guys walk away from this one and go dig a little deeper in this stuff because these are the chemical waves and surges that take you for rides. And sometimes it's a beautiful ride and you love it and you're having a great time, you're in love, nothing could ever go wrong. And other times it is literally like the world is ending. Nothing is ever gonna be beautiful again. And realizing that both of those are somewhat in your control, I think will help tremendously. Yeah, no, no question about it, and I and I think it, it it really does lead lead you to sort of understand what you need. You need you need to be in a relationship that that's positive for you. And and what you're saying too, uh, and how it fits in with your company, uh, one of your credos is about giving back, about being altruistic, and that releases a lot of oxytocin. Sure. Uh, and oxytocin is a favorite hormone, you know, the, the, because you feel good, you feel bonded, you feel empathic. Think about being simple out in nature and appreciating what you have. I was just going to ask you, what do you think is the most powerful rewilding technique that these guys should implement in their lives right now? Well, I think you start with diet and exercise and sleep. I mean, the three things that are, that are really there, and uh, you know, it's hard to choose one over the other. Then you add in nature, huge mindfulness, because if you're exercising, you're more likely to get more mindful, and then that can lead to your valuing and honoring your relationships much more. Mm. I grew up in psychiatry, and we, all we talked about was connection connecting to our patients, connecting with one, with one another. Uh, but it was the center point of our understanding of this psychology and psychiatry and, 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 and healing, being connected 
to the patient so that you uh, can share with them and they can feel that. Um, you guys, after this, do yourself a favor. If nothing else, read the section on meditation. He, we don't have time to go into it now to really do it justice, but he talks about meditation in a way that I've never heard anybody talk. It's completely unique and immediately makes sense from an evolutionary perspective of why it would be so profound and why breath control is meaningful, how it impacts you, um, and the type of meditation that he talks about is instead of counting your breathing or you know, noticing the thoughts that come into your head, the simple edict, notice something new, notice something new, and how that ties into um, the hunter-gatherer mindset of having to be focused on what is going on right now in your environment. It's very powerful. It's gonna be something that I start using in my own life. Uh, very much encourage you guys to do the same. All right, before we go, I got a couple of random questions for you. Just completely uh, Off the mark. out of there, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you had to codify a universal maxim for what people should do with their lives, what would it be? You have uh, all these built-in genetic pushes that you need to pay attention to. You need to play, you need to exercise, you need to move, you need to eat right, you need to sleep, you need to be out in nature, and you need to be connected to others. And from that springs a uh, higher sense of wellness um, and so I, I go back to the uh, Aristotle, know thyself. It's most important. I like it. If you could only recommend one book to people that you didn't write, what book would you recommend? Norman Doidge's book on, he wrote his first book on neuroplasticity and did it in a very understandable way. And this other next book was on how the brain heals itself. And the second chapter is called Walking Off Parkinson's Disease and tells this whole story of, of, that'll blow you away. So it shows you in a, in a very real way how you have the capacity to really change who you are. Mm -hmm. Norman Dorge is great. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Awesome. Dr. Brady, thank you so much for being on the show. Good. What an absolute pleasure. Guys, you are in for a treat with this one. He has written a lot of books. They are all amazing, and you can follow the thread of his career through the different books. You can literally watch him learn and learn alongside him. He is a man that boils things down to their most usable essence, and that is the thing that I'm always looking for in our guests, so there's things that you can apply. I promise it will be time well spent diving into his books. Uh, absolutely incredible, and his understanding of the brain, and most importantly, how to manipulate it to your advantage, in a loving and beautiful way. Guys, you're gonna to wanna to dig in. I, I promise it will uh, make you much better at getting control of your own brain and applying it in ways in your own life that you never thought possible. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, if you aren't already following this man, you should be. I know that he's on Twitter, he's on Facebook, and you can find him at? Uh, JohnRady.com, and on Facebook it's JohnRadyMD, where we post every day a new article on the effect of exercise in, on a wide variety of issues in the schools, the elderly, and just in general in life and what we're learning. It's coming out every day. There's more and more news because the studies are so, uh, there's a tsunami of studies coming out. He gets up to 40 abstracts a week, guys, and he does digest them and put them up on his site. It's absolutely incredible. You're gonna love his social content. Um, if you're not already following us, you can follow us at, at InsideQuest. Instagram, Twitter, we're there. You can also go to InsideQuest.com. And if you want tickets to be in this beautiful audience, you can do that as well. Just go to InsideQuest.com and click the uh, tickets page. And this is a weekly show, so if you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so. You can also get this as a podcast on iTunes. So go there, drop it into Stitcher, whatever preferred method you have. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Until next week, be legendary, my friends. Take care. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Good. It's been a lot of fun for me.